Joining us, Eric Chen. He's technical director at Symantec Security Technology and Response Division. With him, Liam Omerhu, who is director and secure of Security and Technology Response Group at Symantec. Liam's in Ireland. Where are you located, Eric? I'm in Culver City. All right. So Symantec's all over the world with this stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we, you know, attacks happen all over the world at any time of the day, so uh, we always have people on and working. Stuxnet was an interesting story because I think it was the first time we saw a virus that looked like it was created by a government entity, right? Yeah, it, it was definitely one of the first. You know, at that time when Stuxnet came out, we had things that, you know, we felt were at sort of the level of the nation state. But, you know, Stuxnet really had all the makings that it was definitely a nation state. I mean, who else is going in there and trying to basically blow up Iran's nuclear centrifuges? How did, how did it get discovered? Because what uh, originally it was intended only to affect those machines in Iran. Yeah, that's, that's the interesting part is that the actors who were behind it got super aggressive. And basically the way they coded it is that it can spread to any Windows machine anywhere in the world. As long as your machine is on, connected to the internet, you can get infected with Stuxnet. Now, nothing more is potentially gonna happen unless you happen to be hosting a bunch of nuclear centrifuges. Oh, in other words, Stuxnet yeah. might be on your machine, but it's not gonna speed up your centrifuge. It's, it's got, yeah. <laughs> That's right, it's just gonna use your machine to spread to more Windows machines, more Windows machines, oh. in the hopes that eventually it gets into the right place. Well, part of the problem was that these centrifuges in the uranium enrichment facilities were air-gapped, right? Right. So they had to leap the air gap somehow. That's right, and, and that's exactly why they were so aggressive. Um, they used multiple means of spreading, and one of the key means they used of spreading, which is likely the way they jumped into the air gap, was they would spread to USB keys. So you have to imagine, in these air gap networks, there's, there's never an air gap network that's 100% air gap, right? Developers gotta get their code in, they gotta get logs out, and they typically do that by bringing USB keys in and out. And and for those watching who don't know, air gap means it's a it's a machine not hooked up to the network, not hooked up to the yeah, internet. Because so. you'd have to be crazy if you're running Iranian uh, uranium enrichment centrifuges right. to hook them up to the internet. That would be nuts. Well, you want to watch your cat videos while the <laughs> the centrifuges are going. Oh, so oh, I, I mean, I might point out that there are <laughs> machines all over, including hospitals and important medical uh, equipment that in fact are infected now with Stuxnet because they're on the internet. Right. Right. Not to mention ransomware and, and other things. Should we even... Now, by the way, do we know what government created Stuxnet? I mean, we can uh, hypothesize, obviously. We don't know. I mean, there's been, there's been reporting by journalists that uh, claim that it was a uh, U.S. and Israeli operation. Yeah. But the, co the code doesn't tell us that. And we would expect okay. that because, of course, uh, one of the goals of is the Israeli government, and certainly one of our goals, is to keep Iran from becoming a nuclear power. And this and one of the things that's, that's covered in the film actually is, is, a, is about uh, why governments are not talking about this. Uh, why, why, are, why is all this happening? Essentially, we're moving towards cyber war and we have these cyber weapons and there's no rules around that. So a lot of the film covers, uh, you know, government officials not talking about Stuxnet and not talking about cyber war and ask the question, you know, why is that? Why are we not able to talk about this and understand what are the rules here? Yeah, let's mention this movie. This is another Alex Gibney uh, film. It's called Zero Days. Were you guys uh, involved in the production of the movie? We were interviewed for it. Uh, yeah. So Alex, Alex came out and interviewed both of us for about two days. So the issue uh, with Stuxnet uh, is that, in fact, it took advantage, as uh, I would guess, because of uh, Gibney's name in the film, of a, it was a zero-day flaw. Is that, is that correct? That's right. Actually, it had multiple zero-day flaws. That There was actually four Microsoft Windows zero days inside of Stuxnet. And just for some context, I mean, the vast majority of the malware we see doesn't have any zero days inside of it. And if you had one zero day inside, then that would be big news. And that's sort of how it came on the radar of security companies to begin with. Um, and so at most, we saw threats with one zero day. And here we had one that had four zero days inside. So this whole thing was sort of revolutionary in the malware space. What's a zero day? A zero day basically is a vulnerability, a bug in, your, in some software that you use that allows uh, a threat to basically get on your machine and run on your machine without you having to do anything, right? So typically people talk about malicious software and they say, oh, I got to go visit this website or I have to download this email and run this attachment or open this file. If you have a zero day, the threat or an attacker can get on your machine without you having to do anything. And so now, so you guys were somewhat involved in, I mean, Symantec was involved in discovering this. Uh, how, did, how did that all break down? How, uh, how, did, how did the discovery occur? Yeah, so what happened was originally some machines in Belarus uh, got infected with them. And actually a Belarusian security company found that the first samples 
and saw that it had some sort of zero day inside. And they, they couldn't even confirm it. I mean, the code was so complex at that point. And all the security companies around the world, we all share samples and indicators of attacks and things like that to just try to generally help protect the world. And they did so. And when we got the sample, we began to just rip it apart and realize there was much more here than just this single zero day. Gibney, in the film, uh, discovered something called Nitro Zeus. What is that? Yeah, well, what Nitro Zeus is, is that basically, um, you know, you have actors that are doing what we call staging. So they basically put in their implant or malicious software or backdoor code or get credentials into networks all over the place, in critical infrastructure, potentially in an entire country, and they just let them sit there and wait. And then the day there is some sort of geopolitical event that occurs where you want to basically flip the switch, you do so because all your implants are all in the right place. And then you potentially you bring down the power grid, you know, you shut down the water, et cetera. Gibney's contention was that uh, Stuxnet was in fact part of this Nitro Zeus, that this was uh, a sleeper malware, I guess, that waiting for Iran to make progress in its nuclear enrichment program. And was it triggered as, or accidentally or was it? Was it triggered as it had intended to be triggered? Stuxnet. Stux, Stuxnet definitely w w wasn't accidental. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, Stuxnet was basically a totally autonomous piece of code. Um, that so was you can't control it once you release it, right? No, it's still out there today. You have machines getting infected today still. So that sounds like a pretty stupid way to... <laughs> Go, go, Vanna, and I, I, I'm not going to fill in the blanks for you. We every we all should watch Zero Days, but my suspicion is that governments don't want to talk about this because they realize what a risky proposition this all is, right? And cyber warfare can really bite you in the butt. Yeah, it's true. I mean, uh, America itself is uh, very exposed to cyber warfare because it's so interconnected. Uh, you know, everything that uh, that happens in in the U.S. in particular is is all online as much as possible, even uh, industrial control systems. So going out and uh, launching these sorts of cyber weapons, uh, while that's good on an offensive uh, from an offensive point of view, you have to be thinking defensively as well. And America is very exposed. One of the uh, stories, in, and BuzzFeed has the article uh, that uh, is proposed in this film, is that originally Stuxnet uh, was intended for the U.S. to actually keep a lid on Israel. Israel created a more virulent version of <laughs> Stuxnet and released it into the wild, and that actually really upset the United States. Is, is that credible to you? Well, we see I mean, with, with Stuxnet, we actually, there was a configuration file associated with the, the malware. And inside the configuration file, there was things like how virulent it could be. So how many computers could it spread to? How many USB drives could it infect? And how long would it spread for? And what we saw with different versions of Stuxnet was that it got continuously more aggressive. So it started off only spreading for 30 days, and then they moved it up to 90 days, and then up to 180 days. And also, it could inf initially it could infect only three USB drives, and then they moved <laughs> that up to five and 10. So it definitely got, we have, we have technical data that backs up that story. Yeah. Wow. So this is a six-year-old story. What's going on today? Are you seeing in your research labs similar nation-state attacks? There was Flame, FlameNet, right, or Flame? Flame and Dooku and, and Gauss. Dooku. Yeah. Yeah. It actually, since that time, since uh, we've seen Stuxnet, at the time there was maybe one or two operations we thought were being controlled by governments, and now it's since then it's just exploded. So oh, now great. we're tracking about a hundred groups. Uh, that are 100 attacks ongoing that are uh, launched by what we think of governments. Well, yeah, and, that, and that's the big kind of, you know, the question is that, you know, clearly Iran is going to feel like they were attacked, and so why wouldn't they counter with an attack? Plus, there's the continuing threat of whatever's going on in North Korea and China, and, you know, it's, it, there's a whole level of cyber warfare that's going on that we're not even really aware of. And so well, and unlike great. nuclear weapons, the knowledge to create these kinds of weaponized mm -hmm. malware is fairly widespread, right? Everybody's got their hackers. Yeah, yeah everyone, definitely. Everyone has their hackers. But, um, you know, th there's probably a difference between doing something like getting on a network and, let's say, wiping machine, deleting all your data, and, and sort of breaking down centrifuges. You think about the, the Stuxnet operation, you know, there was more than just a, a cyber component. They had to have on-the-ground spies that, you know, somehow stole the designs for these centrifuges. They had to steal centrifuges so they could test them out, you know, to make sure this thing would work. Um, but Definitely, we have governments today going in and, and just trying to do things like, for example, bring down the power grid. Uh, we saw that in December in the Ukraine, for example. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a, to me at least, when I, when I read about this stuff, there's a difference between, you know, viruses and worms that are, you know, building botnets or, or getting access or, or accessing financial systems. But Stuxnet is an example of a worm that is actually looking to do something in the physical world to invade the computers and stop these centrifuges in Iran. Who's to say that somebody doesn't do it back to us that affects the traffic lights or our right. power plants or amusement parks or, you know, like all these things that are controlled via computers. Are, vi are viable targets. Stuxnet was targeting some specific controllers right. by Siemens in these. But but could a bad guy get the code, the Stuxnet code, and, and weaponize it to distribute ransomware? I mean, is there something in there that they could look at and say, oh, that's a good way to do that? It's, it's more about the idea than the actual code. Taking okay. the code and repurposing it is quite tricky. It's, okay. not, it's not impossible, but it is definitely quite challenging. And at, at that point, you'd probably be better off just to start writing your own code from scratch. <laughs> it's, not like, it's, more, it's not like there's really a shortage of kits that you can go on the Internet and buy, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah. It's more about the idea that you can, you can actually do this. It's possible. It's possible to attack physical machines right. via code. And there's yeah. multiple ways to air do that, too. air physical machines, yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. And actually, the air gap is very interesting because the, the air gap forced the attackers to embed the entire payload inside of one malware and we for, for advanced attacks we don't often see that so when we got our hands on Stuxnet we, we always knew if we just kept on analyzing it we would eventually get all of the details out of it ah. and whereas with, with other attacks they may leave the payload out and they will only deliver the payload to one particular victim and it may even be encrypted for that particular victim so your chances of analyzing right. the entire attack are very slim that's why I'm very interested in flame flame is really sophisticated in the sense that it's modular it's uh, self-encrypting. It's very difficult, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's very difficult for you guys to figure out what Flame's doing. That, that's right, that's right. And we're seeing that everywhere now. Everywhere now we see these frameworks where basically right. the attackers can write plugins and they can deliver the specific plugins to the specific machines at the specific time. And they have you know, multiple stages and each stage is encrypted. Only the very first tiny stage is not. And so um, in order to recover them all, you basically have to find all the victims in the world and even then it's possible that you haven't got all the plugins and possibilities. Have you have you actually found the flame loader? Wasn't that one of the issues was it would self-destruct after it <laughs> loaded the payload? Yeah, yeah. So its first delivery mechanism basically would deliver sort of this very small component onto your machine and that first delivery mechanism would just simply disappear. Mm. And that's very smart of the attackers because typically those delivery mechanisms happen through you know, zero days, what we talked about earlier, and zero days are pretty finite. And so if they leave that zero day on the machine, it becomes exposed and then people can patch against it so they can't be, you know, hit by that zero a day right. again. By keeping it hidden and always so deleting smart. it, then less chance of recovery. You're in an interesting field, Eric and uh, Liam, and this is constantly changing. It's getting, it's getting wilder and wilder. From our point of view as users, should we assume... <laughs> That there may be, that there, I mean, look, I do all the normal things to protect right. myself. I update regularly. I make sure, you know, I... Security patches. Sec, and... All this stuff. But can we, I mean, is, do you think that these, these viruses are endemic? Like they're out there everywhere? Should we assume that we are infected, in other words? I don't know if you should assume you're infected. They're definitely out there everywhere. If you don't follow some basic, you know... Uh, security practices, then you probably should assume you're infected. But yeah. look, if you if you keep to the, you know to the safe places of the internet, make sure you're using security software, update and patch yourself. You know you, you put a pretty high hurdle. Remember, attackers are going after the low hanging fruit. There's many many users right. out there who don't even follow the basics, right. and they'll more than happy to go after them first. You just want to put a hurdle to raise the cost of basically <laughs> there, in, in getting your machines. There are plenty of people running Windows XP <laughs> without a router, just <laughs> sitting on the internet, <laughs> just directly. Just hum along. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. Is, is the best advice to avoid Windows at this point? I mean, I feel like... Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, that's, I, you know... Not because you're necessarily safer. I'm running Linux here, but because it's the but because it's a smaller uh, yep. attack surface exactly. and it's less it's less uh, valuable. It is true that, uh, for example, Macs uh, were not attacked really for the last maybe five years ago. They were hardly ever attacked, and since they've since Macs have become more popular, we're starting to see an increase in attacks against Macs. Uh, two years ago, we saw a threat that infected a million Macintoshes in one month. So uh, yeah, so it, it it is it definitely does tie into the popularity of the system that you're using. If your system is less popular, there may be reasons why it's less popular. But if it's less popular, then the attackers may not go after it uh, as quickly. <laughs> and that's the scary thing. I mean, I'm a I'm a OSX. I'm a Mac 
cookies are, and I admittedly have a false sense of security, like, oh, nothing's going to happen to mine. And so you you, can, you always got to keep your guard up no matter what machine you're on and make yeah. sure that you're doing the patches and stuff. I think up Apple's doing some really smart yeah. things under the hood to, to, no. to keep us safe. And frankly, the vectors have changed away from operating systems to other stuff that we used to get online, including things like Adobe Flash, yeah. uh, which aren't being patched as assiduously <laughs> and as effectively. Yeah. So the movie comes out July 8th. You can get it on iTunes. It'll be in theaters as well. It's called Zero Days. You can find out more at zerodaysfilm.com. Alex Gibney, Academy Award winner. Uh, and he really, I think, uncovered some fascinating yeah. stuff. And I can't wait uh, to see this. Scary stuff. Yeah, yeah. It really looks yeah. interesting. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Liam, it really is a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for the good work you do to protect all of us. Thank That's you. Right. We appreciate it.